Okay, so we're in the class of biblical theology. And if you look at your outline, what we've covered so far in this class, the class of biblical theology is understanding the story and scope of the Bible in the big, in the big picture. We, the first week, we looked at what is the Bible? How is it, uh, what's the liter- literature in it? What is the big picture? We began to cover in week two the exegetical tools. We're in the section of the tools that are needed to understand a biblical theology. We're still in that section. So far we've covered the exegetical tools, looking at the genre, the type of literature. We looked at the historical, grammatical approach to understanding the, the Word of God, needing to examine the grammar. And now we're getting into biblical theology tools today. And we're going to look at covenants. We're going to look at horizons of interpretation. We're going to examine the promise, fulfillment, character of scripture, typology, and continuity and discontinuity. These are the key tools to understand the the Bible in the big picture, in the big scope. Okay, so by way of introduction, I love movies. I like adventure movies, sometimes a romance movie, you know, depends. If my wife's there, that helps. Uh, I, I love historical movies. I love action movies. I love the themes that are in movies are stories that, are, that affect the soul. They have, a good movie is a good story. And I, I like to think about how movies are told. What are they, what is they, what are they trying to communicate and why, why are they doing what and where? I like to examine that. And it helps me to understand narratives in the Bible to see what is the, the, the author trying to communicate. Think about, the the point of biblical theology class is to think about the story of history. The story of history and where you fit in to the grand scope. Um, One of my favorite movies is The Lord of the Rings. And you'll forgive this this introduction if it seems a little bit like a nerd, but I'm exposing myself to the truth. Okay, so in the end of one of those movies... Uh, there's two characters who are best friends, Frodo and Sam, and they're in another life-threatening situation. And um, Frodo says, I can't do this, Sam. And Sam says, I know, it's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't know the end, because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way that it was when so much bad has happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come when the sun shines, it will shine out the clear. Those were the stories that stayed with you. They meant something, even when you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back, only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. Frodo says, what are we holding on to, Sam? Sam says that there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. You understand what he's he's saying here is that there are stories that matter, and the stories that matter are the ones where there's a great darkness, but then people fight through it. People fight through it. And he says, what are we holding on to? That there's some good. When the Christian is in great times of darkness, what does he hold on to? But there's not, that there's something good, not in us, but in Jesus Christ. And in what God is doing throughout the, the history of the world. The, the big picture of what God is doing is what holds you through the dark times, what gets you through from turning back. That's what biblical theology is. Understanding the, the Bible as a whole. And it's key for, to live for the Lord and it's key to die for the Lord. Okay, so starting on the week three outline, 
the week three outline. We're going through tools that are needed for you to read your Bible and understand the big picture of the scripture. So first is understanding that the self-revelation of the word comes through covenants. It comes through covenants. God has condescended, God has condescended, humbled himself to communicate with us in a way that we would understand. And in the, the time of the book of the law, in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the, what is a key part of the culture is covenants. And covenants typically had these five points that you'll see on your outline. A preamble, a historical prologue, stipulations, a document clause, and blessings and cursings. So covenants are key to understanding the big picture of the Bible. And in order to understand a covenant, you should understand these different parts that take place. Um, let's turn to Exodus 20. You're going to see this taking place. Exodus 20, starting in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. And he goes on to continue with the rest of the commandments. Look at your outline and see, in a covenant, there is a preamble that identifies the parties to the covenant. Okay, here in Exodus, God is the key party in the covenant. There's a historical prologue, point two, there's a historical prologue outlines what the great king has already done for the vassal king. You remember how the, in Deuteronomy is set up with a suzerain vassal treaty or a suzerain vassal covenant. The suzerain is the greater king, the vassal is the lesser king. So there's a greater king, lesser king idea in a covenant. It's a, a covenant made between a, a, um, a greater king, lesser king, his servant. In this case, it's God with Israel. And the great king outlines what he's already done for the vassal king. If you see in Exodus, Exodus 2, the great king, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You see that in, in Exodus 22? That's the historical prologue. Then there's stipulations given in a covenant. The summary and detail of what is expected of the vassal. But what are the stipulations? In Exodus, it's chapter 20, the Ten Commandments. And it goes on through chapter 23 with more stipulations. What is expected? Often, historically, there's the document clause. Stipulations where the covenant of where the copies of the covenant are to be placed, when it should be read, and who the witnesses are. Typically, the, the gods were called to be witnesses of the covenants. Well, and if you continue through Exodus, where the covenant is to be held is, is told in Exodus 25, 21, in the, in the Ark of the Covenant, and in Exodus 24, 1 to 11, it talks about how it should be read, who the witnesses are, these elements are there. So then where are the blessings and the cursings? Well, if you remember the, your, your Old Testament law, Deuteronomy is packed full of the blessings and the cursings. And the, the unit of the Torah or the law, it, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, is originally written as one book. And so the blessings and cursings come at the end at the reiteration of the law. So those elements are in the beginning of the Bible, okay? Look now on your next page of the outline. There's a definition of a covenant. A covenant is not merely a contract. It's not merely a promise. It is a bond in blood that establishes an all-encompassing relationship. It's a claim on someone's total loyalty and allegiance. And that is secured with the life of the vassal. Okay, so it is not just a, con a contract, not just a promise. It is a bond of blood that is an all-encompassing relationship. In other words, in to be in covenant with God means you owe him your total allegiance. 
It is, in, encompasses all of your life, and you owe him all of your lo loyalty and allegiance. So when, in the original language, um, to make a covenant is called cutting a covenant. And that's because it was typical in the covenant to, for animals to be torn in pieces or cut in pieces, often um, to symbolize what happens to the vassal if he does not obey the stipulations in the covenant. Sometimes so much so that the animal's um, legs would be cut off and put in the animal's mouth to illustrate this in the, time of, in the time of the Exodus. So God has humbled himself to communicate with his people in a way that they would understand culturally. Just like we have a Bible where it's filled with stories, poetry, letters, the different genres, it's, God humbles himself to communicate to us in ways that we understand. And covenant is a, the key way to understand the Bible and the, in the big picture of the Bible. And so there's different types of covenants. Covenants of works or covenants of grace. And we see here in the outline the difference lies in, the, in those who take the oath and so undertakes to suffer the curses should the covenant be broken. We, I'm going to be covering this very briefly because we've already spent a, a class on this. Okay, So the seven biblical covenants... You remember them from our class on the covenants, the covenant, so the covenant of works made with Adam, Genesis 2, 15 to 17. That, that is the, the time in which um, Adam would be tempted and tested in the, the garden. It was not for an indefinite period of time. There was the covenant of redemption implied in Genesis 3, 15 with with the, the first time the gospel is spoken. We see the Noahic covenant, where made with Noah and all the living creatures, Genesis 9, 8 to 17, and the sign was the rainbow. You know, you've heard the rainbow is the warrior's bow at rest. Or the warrior's bow at rest, as in the bow and arrow, that symbols that God's uh, judgment will not come in, by way of a flood anymore. The Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 15, made with Abraham, his seed, there's this, and the sign of it is the circumcision. There's the Mosaic covenant, Exodus 20, 25, and retold in Deuteronomy, made with the people of Israel, and the sign is both circumcision and the Sabbath. The Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel 7, and the sign is by the birth of a son. Here is a great picture of the covenant of grace. And in the new covenant that's, that's promised in Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, and fulfilled in the Lord when he says, this is my blood of the new covenant. Okay, so to understand covenants, there are three horizons of interpretation. So we're going to get into this, um, the horizons. First, there's the textual understanding. Okay? So if you take... Um, there's what's happening on in the text. For example, let's let's um, let's turn to Genesis 15 to understand these multiple horizons of the covenant. Okay, Genesis 15. After these words, the word of the Lord came to Abram with a, in a vision saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your, your exceedingly great reward. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This one shall not be your heir, but, to whom, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward the heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. And then he said to him, I am the Lord who will brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. 
So first, when you look and understand of the different layers of a covenant, there's the textual, there is the epoch or the administration, and then there's the canonical, the understanding the big picture. So it, what I mean by textual, for example, would be what's going on with the cutting up of animals that happens at, right after this text that we read. What does this mean personally for Abraham? These are the questions you would ask of, in the particular the textual understanding of what's happening with the covenant. Then you would want to ask the epoch questions. How was the promise fulfilled and kept in the life of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph? Then ask yourself, how does this relate to the patriarch family's departure to Egypt? So how does this promise continue on when the family departs from Egypt? This, this covenant has implications throughout the book of Genesis and throughout the law. Then when you, you would look at, so first you look at the text, then you look at the epoch, then you look at the canon as a whole. What is this covenant, how does it relate to the new covenant established in Christ's blood? In what sense are Christians the seed of Abraham? Yes? Epoch is going to focus on um, the, the closer time frame, okay? As opposed to where we're at. Where we're at is the, the end of the canon, looking at the whole scripture as a whole. But before that's completed, what does, that, what does this covenant mean for Isaiah? What does this covenant mean particularly for Jacob and for the people of Israel as they're reading this for the fir first time from hearing it from Moses? Does that make sense? Okay, so what this class is, rem remember the big picture of the class. The class is, um, is giving you tools, okay? I'm not going to go over the details of every text. I'm just saying, how do we understand the Bible as a whole? With exegetical tools and with biblical theology tools. So what we're covering is the biblical theology tools. So when you, again, refer back to your outline with the three horizons of interpretation. You ask, what's going on with the text? What's going on with the epoch? What's going on in the canon? How does this affect these things as a whole. Um, so, that understanding the epoch is when you read, you know, maybe this will help clarify too, is, is understanding, okay, what stage are we in? What stage are we in in the scope of the scripture? When you're reading, say, Leviticus 9. What stage are we in with, in Leviticus 17? Say, when you're, um, we're to offer sacrifices. So that the offering of sacrifices that is commanded in Leviticus 17 is understood because of the, you understand that we don't apply that today because we're in a different epoch. We're in a different administration. We're in a different um, time frame. There are new commandments that have come that make that um, obsolete. Okay, so um, it's important to understand the epochs or the biblical divisions that the, author, that the authors of scripture outline and give. Some of those clear, give you some clear examples from the scripture. Old Testament to New Testament, right? You can't get much clear with a difference in the epoch or a difference in an administration. Romans 5 talks about the time before and after giving of the law. The, the, Romans 5 also talks about the division before and after Adam's fall. Galatians 3 refers to the Mosaic epoch as a caretaker period, but not giving salvation. 2 Peter 3, 6-7, talks about a major division of the world's, world's flood and how the Lord's not going to again flood the world, but he will flood it with fire. In Acts 7, when Stephen speaks about the history of uh, of redemption and of what the Lord is doing. He speaks of the time of the patriarchs. He speaks of the time of the Mosaic epoch and of the monarchy when there are kings. In Isaiah 63 to 64, there, Isaiah contrasts the time of Abraham and the time of Moses with the exilic period. And he has a prayer for another Sinai event when God would rend the heavens. So 
the, script, the authors of scripture note that there are different times or epochs, different administrations, whatever term you want to label it with, throughout the scripture. And that these important events help you understand they're, they're the, the signposts throughout the scripture to help you understand the big picture. They're key for biblical interpretation, okay? It's why we're not offering a lamb today as part of the worship. And I'm sure you're glad, right, that you don't have to buy one and bring one. Okay, so there very briefly is how um, the Bible is um, given through covenants, those seven biblical covenants, and understanding the different horizons of interpretation. The next outline, we're flying through in order to catch up for last week, okay? So the next outline is, again, sets of tools to understand biblical theology. So the tools in this outline are the prophetic character of scripture with promise fulfillment, typology, and continuity discontinuity. These are all keys that will help you understand your Bible, okay? So first off, the promise fulfillment of the scripture. Um, this is fundamental to God's character, that God gives promises and he keeps them. It's not some random in good intentions you see in your outline, but they point and delineate a divine plan for history, that redemptive history is linear, and it follows a pattern and a framework. Aren't you glad that God is writing the story of history and that the story of history is not cyclical? It doesn't go like um, some Eastern philosophy where, um, well, what has happened before will happen again and, and eternity will just always continue in the same sort of circular event. That's not the way the Bible describes history. There, there's a beginning and an end. It's a linear thing. And we are involved in that story. And the promises are the glue of the Bible. The promises are the glue of the Bible. They're, they hold the Bible together, and they'll hold you together if you understand the promises. They're, they reflect God's divine plan for history. Now, to understand the promises, we understand that there are multiple horizons of fulfillment when God gives promises. Okay? So, under multiple horizons of fulfillment in your outline, I'm reading the, the promises of God, prophecies in the broadest sense of the term, typically have multiple horizons of fulfillment. What's more, each successive fulfillment is not only la later in time chronologically, but greater in significance, both theologically and historically. Okay, so let's turn to Genesis 12 and we'll look and consider what the scripture has to say and you'll see these multiple horizons of the promise fulfillment. Genesis 12, reading verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who curse you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, so consider the promises here of the land, seed, blessing. The seed can be seen in verse 7, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, or said to your seed, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Okay, so by multiple horizons, in other, in other words, uh, the mountain peaks in which the, this promise can be seen and fulfilled, First, you can see how the promise is fulfilled in the birth of Isaac. And then how Isaac has Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons. 
So in reading through Genesis, you see the promise being fulfilled. Then you see how, reading on in Exodus, how the promise is fulfilled in Moses and the nation of Israel being constituted as a nation holy to God. Where, where he becomes a, a great nation, the seed of Abraham. Then we see how the promise is fulfilled later on with Joshua and the people where he provides the first fulfillment of the land. Then the promise continues on and we see under Solomon's reign the blessing being to other nations happening and we see the fulfillment of the land um, being given in, in the greatest way, in the greatest expansion to history to date of what Israel had. Then if you read on in your Bible, you see the promise, the same promise coming again in Galatians where Christ is seen as the true seed. And remember how we talked about how the word for seed in Hebrew can be like our seed, the way it can be plural or singular. It has a multi-purpose, it's multi-purpose or multi-use. Like you can say, I have a bag of seed. You know, you got more than one. Or I have a seed here. You have one. It can be plural or singular. In the same way, the Bible uses it to say the seed of the many the people of Israel, and then in Galatians refers to the seed of the one, of Jesus, and how he has come, and that true children of Abraham are of all nations now. We see how this promise for the land is fulfilled even in Revelation, with the new heavens and the new earth, the land that's given to the children of Abraham is expands out to the whole world. Okay, so think about all the different horizons that happen in this promise. How wonderful are the promises of God. When someone promises something to you, like imagine you go to a used car salesman and he promises something to you. This is the best deal that you'll ever get. Consider the promise that you'll receive from um, Massey, or not Massey, what's that? Um, holler Honda or something, right? You guys have seen a million commercials for used car. The promise that you receive today compared to the promises of God. God's promises are so much greater than even you see first in your first hand reading of Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Of Genesis 12, 1 to 7. You don't see all the multi layers of the promise of God and how it expands out to the entire universe, how it expands out to the entire world. It's difficult to see here. But then when you're reading, you're concluding the Bible at the end of Revelation, you see how this same promise has come. What a blessing to know the promises of God. This will help you to understand the promise fulfillment and how there's multiple horizons to the a fulfillment to the promises of God. Next, looking at typology. So we cover promise fulfillment, typology. Typology can be abused, but it is, there's a balance to it. It is a great blessing when it's rightly understood, an extreme blessing. But there's also a warning of how it can be abused. For example, um, the key... Understanding typology keeps you from just moralizing the Bible. Just thinking, reading the Old Testament and thinking, well, here's a life lesson for me to learn in order to be a better person. And you read the Old Testament like a Muslim or like a Jew in Judaism, where you read the Old Testament, and you're like, well, I'll just try harder. I'll just do better. It's about me living a more righteous life and that alone. And typology helps you to understand that in the Old Testament, how it's pointing to redemption and the big picture. So typology keeps you from just moralizing the Bible. It helps you get your eyes off yourself to understand salvation, Christ. But then there's a warning about typology that it can be abused and misused and misinterpreted 
where it be, can, can become an allegory, a wild allegory. Okay, so reading some of these outlines in order to help keep us balanced in the, the, the way the Bible uses typology. I'm reading the definition of the one definition. Typology is simply symbolism with a pers- um, prospective reference to fulfillment in a later epoch of biblical history. It involves a fundamentally organic relation between events, persons, institutions, the type in one epoch with its counterparts, anti-type in the later epochs. So typology involves a type and then the anti-type. Okay, that's what we get out of, out of that definition, the very basic form, okay? Next, the biblical understanding of types is that there's an organic relationship between the essential aspect of type and anti-type. So there must be an essential aspect. It can't be just an allegory. That's what's in the parentheses. There must be uh, a biblical basis for the establish, you're establishing a type. Types, I'm reading from the outline, types involve a comparison of historical realities that establish an analogy or pattern that organically develops and expands. So what, what do we mean by when we're saying these things about organically expands? For example, Romans 5, 14, Adam is a type of Christ. Adam is a type of Christ. It's not just a, a comparison. It's not like, well, you know... Adam was kind of like Jesus in this way. That's not what a, a type is. It has more weight to it than that. But there is a historical reality and correspondence between the two. The type the, helps you understand the anti-type. The type um, helps you to understand that there is a change in degrees. In other words, like Adam... Let's read um, Romans 5, and you can see the theology of type explained by Paul. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus sin death spread to all men because all sinned for until the law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed where there is no law and here we get into the explanation of the type nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam so everyone sinned like Adam who is a type of him who was to come so Adam is the type Christ is the anti-type. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ abounded to many. So we see here that Adam was much smaller, lesser of a picture than Christ. The type expands. You have it expands to the greater, to help you understand the greater anti-type. And if you read the fourth paragraph in our outline under typology, it says, and so like the prophetic promise, the type in scripture often finds its fulfillment in multiple anti-types, each pointing beyond itself to one still greater yet to come. So in, if you're going to do typology, if you're going to understand typology according to the scripture, It's going to help you understand the big picture of the Bible. It's going to be a historical realities, both of them, historical realities, and the type in the Old Testament is going to expand out to a greater picture in the New Testament. And sometimes it has multiple fulfillments. Um, So to give you some examples, in in the book of Hebrews, the temple... The temple is a type of Christ. The priesthood is a type of Christ. The sacrificial system is a type to point to Christ. In all of these things, the first, the type, is smaller in significance and expands out to a greater significance to point to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So think about the restraint now, the restraint. How can we restrain this from just coming up with um, our own ideas like, you know, um, David, you see the, the five stones that David picked up in order to slay Goliath? You know what those five stones are? They are the doctrines of the five points of Calvinism. And so, so some people have actually taught that, okay? So how would you say that, how can you re- stop that and say, you, we would all look at that and go, that's really weird. How could you jump from there to there? Well, Adam was a type of, of Christ, just like... So how would you restrain yourself from doing some mishandling of the Bible like that? Well, look on, look on the outline. Um, point one, there must be a real, historical, essential resemblance or analogy between type and anti-type. Like King David to King Jesus. Like the, found in the Davidic Covenant. The type, point two, the type must be clearly, providentially designed to foreshadow God's ultimate redemptive activity in Christ. Accidental similarity is not enough to make a, con- a connection. So in other words, if I say, remember the story of Balaam's donkey? Balaam's donkey rebu- rebuked a false teacher. Jesus rebuked false teachers. So, Je- so Balaam's donkey is a type of Christ. No, there must be not just an accidental similarity. No, there must be a providentially designed foreshadowing of God's ultimate redemptive activity in Christ. You can't just make it up. There must, point three, there, unlike a mere symbol, which represents a general truth, a type by its nature must look forward to the greater fulfillment. In other words, um, blood is a symbol for life in the Old Testament. Christ gives life, but, um, but blood isn't uh, a type in itself. So the, whether Joseph is a type is, to be honest, is not something I've studied. So I'll, I'll be honest, it's not, I haven't come to a conclusion about that. Um, so instead of answering you know, the particulars about um, interpretation, I'm just trying to broad scope the tools, and then um, in the application of those tools, then if you want to co- yeah, talk to me after class about those. I'll I'll need to study that one more, brother, and then I'll have to come back to you next week. And in order, I don't want to say something that um, that would be wrong now. But I do want to bring back to you. I don't want to um, push off the question. I do want to answer it. I just want to uh, think about it more thoroughly before I, I give an answer. So come back next week and and hold me accountable to the response to that, okay? Christian? Yeah, uh, by shadow, I think it's, it's a term that the Hebrews is just using. To, it's a figurative term to describe the, the, the type to help you understand how it's the lesser as opposed to the greater. The shadow is um, lesser than the greater reality of Christ. Okay, so um, moving along in our, in our last few minutes that we have. Continuity and discontinuity. Okay, so what we've been talking about is all continuity from this point. How do the covenants are, have continuity throughout the scripture? How the typology shows continuity? How the, we see the continuity through the different um, epochs and throughout the canon. 
So despite the, the continuity of God's saving actions plans, the movement of, from promise to fulfillment is described in the scripture as a movement from shadow into reality, from mere copy and the genuine article, to the genuine article, and between mere symbol and the truth is represents. In addition to continuity, there's a significant discontinuity as we move across the epochs. Okay? So discontinuity in point one is required to ultimately fulfill the promise. For example, in 2 Samuel 7, um, originally thinking on the unending dynasty, um, when you think about the how the promise is in the Davidic covenant that the, someone will re, there will be a king reigning on the throne of David for all of time. When you originally would read that in, in 2 Samuel 7, uh, most people would tend to think when they read that, okay, someone from the line of David is going to remain on the throne. But in the Bible, it's Christ who's going to have eternal dominion and reign. And how that fulfillment has a form of discontinuity. It's different than what you would originally think. In order for it to ultimately fulfill the promise. Instead of it just being David's descendants always on the throne. Instead it is one descendant who will always be on the throne. Point two, discontinuity required by the very nature of the fulfillment itself. For example, the new covenant has a different nature to it. And it's described in, in Jeremiah 31 how is it, it will be unbreakable, how all the members will be regenerate, how it happens by natural, not by natural birth, but by supernatural birth. So by its very nature, there must be a difference, a discontinuity. So how do we get a sense of both kinds of discontinuity? Um, For example, look in Galatians 3.21. Galatians 3.21, is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by, by the law. So we see discontinuity described in the scripture between the difference between the Mosaic epoch and the law and how the old couldn't bring life. But there's a difference. The difference is a difference of effectivity. What the law could not achieve, could not be effective in, Christ is effective in. How it f Christ fulfills the old. And in that fulfillment, it reveals the glory of God. All of these things, you know what they're supposed to help you to do? They're supposed to help you to, to see the big picture of the Bible, that... Christ is the final word. Christ is the true high priest. Christ is the Lamb of God. Christ is the true temple. Christ is the true rest. Why do we celebrate, you know, why do we have the Lord's Day today? And believe that, because it pictures something greater to come. The true rest that will come at the end of, with the new heavens and the new earth. The true rest that we have in Christ if you understand these things, you can understand the big picture of the Bible, and it will, in turn, it will cause you to worship the Lord, it will cause you to love him more, it will cause you to understand your Bible better. It should lead you, ultimately, to the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ and to see that, the, that through him, you exist in the great story of the word of God and the, um, by the praise of the glory of his grace. You do that by employing a, a careful, right application of typology, discontinuity, continuity, promise, fulfillment, understanding of the covenants. Brothers, 
um, there is great disagreement about these different terms and how to employ them. But there is great agreement that they should be employed. When you employ them, there becomes differences. That's why um, there's Presbyterians and Baptists because of the difference of how to employ these um, uses of biblical theology. So I'm not going to say that it's easy, but I'm going to say that it's worth it. It's worth it to understand this discipline because in turn it will lead to the revelation of our Savior. It is worth the time and work to, to put in these things. And I'll admit I have a lot to grow in these things, but so do you. But so do you. And when you do, like I, like I said, it, you will worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read to you um, to close a song that helps me to think about these different themes and the big themes of the scripture and worship of the Lord. On a starlight hillside, shepherds watched their sheep. Slowly, David's city drifted off to sleep. But to this little town of no great renown, the Lord had a promise to keep. Prophets had foretold it, a mighty king would come, long-awaited ruler, God's anointed one. But the sovereign of all looked helpless and small as God gave the world his own son. And who would have dreamed or ever foreseen that we could hold God in our hands? The giver of life is born in the night, revealing God's glorious plan to save the world. Wondrous gift of heaven, the Father sends the Son, planned from time eternal, moved by holy love. He will carry our curse, and death he'll reverse, so we can be daughters and sons. And who would have dreamed, or ever foreseen, that we could hold God in our hands? The giver of life is born in the night, revealing God's glorious plan to save the world. You know, Lord of the Rings is a, is a, um, is a nice story. Um, it doesn't, can't hold a candle to the, the story of the Savior of our world. When you understand these things in biblical theology, you will understand the big picture of why you exist, and you will worship our Savior as he fulfills his plan to save the world. Let's, let's pray to him. Dear Lord, we worship you and we pray, please help us to wisely, obediently follow what your word has to say about types, discontinuity, continuity, the application of these things. Because we want to see you and know you as revealed in your word rightly. We want to employ them as we understand biblical theology. Please help us with these tools. We need your word, and we need to understand it greater than what we do right now. We want to give you glory for your great plan to save the world. So, Lord, help us, we pray. Amen.